So let's jump into this. Venus is a really interesting archetype. It's both incredibly internal and external at the same time. And I, I don't think there's any other planetary symbol that holds the same kind of energy. So we know Venus is about relationships. So that's obviously the external component. It's we're going to be attracted to other people. We're going to naturally be drawn to create partnership. We're going to be experiencing all kinds of relational experiences wherein the learning of balance, giving, receiving, how to ask, how to communicate, when to say no, when to say yes, that very external relational facet of human experience is obviously a Venus thing. But it's also deeply internal. Fundamentally, Venus corresponds to our inner relationship to ourself. So you can think of it as your inner beloved, your inner lover. How do we listen to and honor and hear our own needs? How do we determine and supply for our own basic needs? And herein lies, to some degree, the essential conflict within the Venus archetype. And this is Venus in general. Imagine how interesting it gets when you add Pluto to the mix. We are all responsible for our own feelings, feelings being a Venus thing corresponding to the ability to sense and be in relationship to what's happening on the inside. When we feel something, we're actually in relationship to that which we're feeling. And it's the same thing as listening. Listening to another person is actually on some level feeling them, right? I'm allowing myself to be receptive to the field of their energy. And really listening to another is really hearing them according to their reality. I really hear you. I'm letting it imprint. I'm letting it come into me. I'm in relationship to you. Like that is the essence of relationship. And to make a distinction between that and Mercury, Mercury is the physiology of hearing. So I'm hearing your words. I'm taking it in as data, as information, and I'm synthesizing it. The Venusian hearing is a listening. I'm hearing you. What is it you're wanting to say to me? Not so much data collection. So there's, there's much more of a, of a personal, relational component where we are interested in, concerned with, focused on what another person needs, what another person wants, what is important to another person. And that listening is the same way that we relate to ourself. What do I want? What do I feel? What do I need? And that's why I say the, the nature of Venus is so deeply internal and external. We're so engaged in this experience of hearing and listening and engaging with the external world, but also at the same time, what's in here? And going too far out of balance in either direction, right? We can be in a relationship with someone and be entirely focused on the inner environment to the exclusion of being interested in what the other person is needing, feeling, wanting, what they want us to know about them. Or we can be overly concerned with the outer environment and deny our own feelings. Like, why well, can't need that or want that or I can't have that boundary here because I need to give to them. So thus is the ebb and the flow and the seesaw of human experience in the Venus archetype. And just to give one more note when it comes to the physical dimension of Venus. As I mentioned, with Venus, we're learning how to listen to what we need and be in conscious relationship to our environment, right? With our attention rooted in self-love, right? Self-esteem, self-worth, it means fundamentally, it's not about, I deserve to always have these things with me, right? Like these physical things imply and equal and define the fact of my self value. That can again be an expression of an overly commodified and overly materialistic state of Venus, where in fact, there is a lack of self value. We've learned to associate with external conditions as a way to provide a sense of value because we're not defining it from within. But it doesn't mean we won't have the things that we want or like. It means fundamentally we know how to be in conscious, responsive relationship to our experience. We know how to get the things we want. 
we know how to find the things we need. If those things are lacking, we know what to do or how to choose in order to provide for ourselves what will give us the feeling or the experience that we're wanting to have in life. There's an empowered quality to a healthy Venus that's going to respond to life experience in a way that reflects the life that one is wanting to experience and feel from within. Thus, it's an attitude. There isn't going to be a sense of lack or deprivation within Venus when the individual understands that it's their responsibility to make choices and to respond to the ebb and the flow of life experience. People's behavior, physical resources, the temperature, the weather, the presence or absence of certain things, things working or not working, this is always changing, right? This in a way is where Venus sort of draws from Pluto. And it's interesting because when we look at Venus Pluto, this is something in the series as I go through each planet, there's gonna be a point where we're gonna look at a polarity. Um, at least once, if the planet rules two signs, we'll have two of these instances. So in this case, Pluto is the ruler of Scorpio, and Venus is the ruler of Taurus, right? And Libra, but in this case, Taurus, Scorpio, polarity. So we're actually looking at uh, an entire axis here. Inherently within Venus, we have the need to draw upon the teachings of Pluto, which says life is impermanent. The thing that makes you feel good the person, place, thing, experience that makes you feel good isn't going to stick around. It's not going to last very long. It'll stay for a while, minutes, seconds, years, but it's not going to last forever. And so there's, there's a learning wherever we become overly dependent or fixated on something external of our being, something external of ourself, providing for our needs, is where in that Venus journey, we're gonna be thrown back to ourselves in order to actually determine for ourselves what we need and how we're gonna get that need met. Now let's look at Pluto. The challenge with Venus Pluto is then we're associating that whole dimension of pleasure, sensation, feeling good, survival, and we're fixating that on external object focus and it, that can become a point of obsession and exclusive focus on people, places, and things that I've focused and determined as what will make me feel the way I want to feel. This can become a very sticky issue when we identify something in a person that fundamentally reflects the value that we have not yet awakened to in ourself. And so we psychologically fixate and associate that person as something that we need. I want to form an intimacy with that individual. I want to get close with that person because they're representing something in me that I want to awaken to. And being close to them, either receiving their love, their affection, their sexuality, or just having relationship with them in whatever form is a way that I'm going to osmose from the outside that which I have not yet realized is on the inside. That's fine. Where this gets sticky is where this can become a predominantly unconscious reality that leads to obsessive behavior, a, a compulsive ad addiction to particular people. So we can become totally consumed by that and that becomes an issue. Now, let's say that person is interested in someone else. And so the Venus Pluto person can feel a deep jealousy, a deep sense of my sense of value and worth is being deeply affected by this individual that I'm focused upon not being interested in me. If they were interested in me, then that would make me feel loved and lovable. But it's not the same as awakening to the power within my own soul that I'm attracted to on the outside, but that's actually on the inside. The other issue with that is very often Venus Pluto will find themselves in deep hypnotic attractions to other people where it's like there's a compulsive need to form really, and it can be, you know, Pluto is always going to have a sort of taboo dimension. And so it can be, oh, th this person is like, that's the hot guy, the hot girl, or that's, that's the cheerleader, or that's, that's the popular one. And 
maybe the existing self-image has been such that I never imagined myself being with someone that attractive. I never imagined with myself being with someone with that much money or being with someone famous, <sighs> me with someone famous, right? Or so, you know, whatever the associations are, right? You can imagine all kinds of associate, right? Someone that's an artist, someone that's a musician, someone that's um, a, a, a well-known writer. We might find ourselves at a certain point drawn to these individuals, you know, and it can, it can start as a sort of like um, casual obsession, safe obsession. We're just inter interested or infatuated, but it doesn't really consume us entirely. But then it becomes a sort of, I guess infatuation would be a sort of consumption. It becomes an infatuation and then it becomes a need. Um, this can be low grade on the level of, you know, a celebrity or someone that you at some point become so obsessed with. It starts with watching videos and, you know, getting to know everything about them and needing to be at every event that then it's like, how can I get closer to them, right? And then maybe, can I actually have a relationship with them? So one can manipulate their way into the life of someone else that maybe at a certain point along their journey, they never even imagined they would get close to that person. But as the desire grows, that fixation brings that soul into proximity with that point of focus. And so it can be uh, driven by all kinds of deeply seated, unprocessed insecurities with that compulsive need to get closer. And the issue is usually what happens with these Venus Pluto, they get close with that individual and they get that power, right? They get the sex, the attention, the acknowledgement, they get the vulnerability, right? Think about vulnerability here. It's an interesting thing. From a scorpionic Pluto point of view, when a person shows you their vulnerability, they're actually um, allowing you to have a certain power, right? When, when, when someone is vulnerable with you, they're allowing you to hold them, right? In a place where they're revealing their sensitivities, their weakness, right? Their fears. For the Pluto Venus people to come into a place where I, I'm the powerful one now, I'm holding or caring for or loving or dominating sexually, or whatever it might be. Um, where I, I found this person's insecurity, I've made them jealous, right? all these different psychological points. But what that symbolizes now is I've been able to get myself to a point where I feel that power that I otherwise felt that I lacked. And what very, very often happens is the Venus Pluto, and this is one side of the coin, there's another dimension too. The Venus Pluto person will then drop the individual that they otherwise maybe really, really wanted the moment they've gotten what they need. So that's sort of equaling the, 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 the obsessive psychology of Pluto with the commodification of Venus. Oh, I got my need met. So I no longer need to focus on osmosing and getting this which I need from the outside because I got it already, right? And then it's the next goal, right? What is my next object focus? And it could be, you know, whatever symbol of wealth and power and value and pleasure that the soul associates will become the next point of focus. And I see this all the time. In fact, in counseling, this is one of the hardest things to take responsibility for. We can find ourselves getting into a relationship with people that we gave our power away to because we saw them as more powerful than us. And we thought that getting in relationship with these individuals would give us something that we lacked, right? And then things get hard in the relationship. Or maybe that person we got into a relationship with, um, to give a different example, um, now this other person wants something different, right? Or is cheating on them or isn't interested anymore or you know, isn't meeting basic needs. Dealing with the reality of the other person, their feelings, their needs, and how they're not making us feel the way we want them, the way we want us, the, the way we want them to make us feel, that can be really hard. 
taking responsibility for our own feelings and supplying for our own needs can be one of the hardest things with Venus Pluto. Hands down. There can be an immense amount of resistance because of the fact that Venus is incredibly security driven. Venus on the most, again, basic biological level does not want to feel insecure, does not want to um, feel any kind of destabilization. And so if I've already identified that this person is gonna make me feel the way that I want to feel and I'm wanting to have this experience, that can be one of the hardest experiences. And thus, when it comes to the listening, the need for listening within Venus, that can be a true block to true intimacy. I actually listening to the other person's reality. And they come at the same place. If I cannot listen to my own need and honor and respect my feelings and determine what I need to do to provide for them, right? And th they're linked, right? True listening means true caring. If we're not really caring, we're not really going to be listening, right? We'll have sensation and we'll try to fix the sensation, but that's not true listening. So if I can't listen to myself, I'm not going to be able to listen to another person and really become interested in what do they actually want? What do they actually need? And this is where betrayals and, you know, you did this and that really hurt. We can get fixated and stuck on that because I needed and expected or wanted you to be a certain way. And I can't get over that you betrayed my trust. But fundamentally, it comes back down to what do you really want? What do you really need? So one of the mature elements within relationship are conscious agreements, right? Very often with Venus Pluto, we're not going to have a lot of conscious agreements, right? And I'm, I'm speaking to the shadow stuff now. There's a lot of power and good stuff going on, but we'll get there later. There's going to be a lot of, I'm here because you're giving me something psychologically that I believe I need. And also there's something probably in it for you as well. And there's oftentimes a sort of power dynamic that's held in place um, by that level of unconsciousness. But where needs and, and intentions aren't brought to the table consciously, where two people aren't working on how to actually meet each other and where they can't meet each other and where to respect that, there's going to be a lot of baggage that's going to come up later on. So my teacher once told me a beautiful teaching not one person will ever meet all of the needs of another person. And that's a strategy that creator designed so that we don't become dependent on others and we ultimately determine so that we don't, it's a strategy that creator designed to enforce that we ultimately are fundamentally dependent on creator, on the source, on our soul, right? The fact that nothing in this world and no person will ever meet all of our needs is a way in which we're ultimately thrown back on ourselves to make our primary relationship, our primary dependency on the inside. Because on the outside, it's never going to be 100% exactly what we need. And as wonderful of our relationships and our, our ideals are, one person is never ever going to meet anyone's needs 100% ever, never possible because we're fundamentally the ones responsible for knowing who we are and determining our own needs and actually finding out who do I want to be? How do I want to feel? How do I want to relate to myself? And other people may not be living and relating and valuing the same things that we value. But can we be true to ourselves? Can we cultivate fidelity to our own soul? So Pluto Venus fundamentally is fidelity to our own soul. These individuals are learning how to find self-value and self-esteem within their soul, which is our unchanging essence, like our true power. As things come and go, as people come and go, as people meet or don't meet our needs, as strong craving and aversions arise, fundamentally, this is all happening within ourself. Where do we allow ourselves to become disempowered or to lose our own agency? So now, everything I've spoken can also be dynamics that the Pluto of Venus person experiences from the outside, right? The Pluto Venus individual can become the object of intense obsession and focus from other people, right? Other people might project onto the Venus Pluto person, um, you're really powerful. Your sexuality, your value, these qualities of you are something that I'm deeply attracted to, and I want to form a relationship to that. 
Right? So the issue here is the Venus-Pluto individual can easily get drawn into other people's externalized projected needs for something on the outside that they're wanting to actually deflect their own self-relationship and osmose something from that individual. And depending on the dynamics of the Venus-Pluto, one of the strongest um, points of enmeshment and entanglement is the addiction to affinity. So Venus as the ruler of Libra, the issue is, well, I'm in this relationship and I'm addicted to meeting these other people's needs. I'm addicted to pleasing them, to making them feel good, to making them feel wanted. And so an individual can literally get pulled into dynamics where they give themselves away. They lose their soul, Pluto, to relationship, no longer identifying and defining their own needs. So issues of being possessed or controlled or held in manipulative kind of experiences, being on either side of the coin is incredibly common with Venus Pluto. So one of the deep evolutionary lessons is to be able to understand that the way that we feel is the starting point for then being able to cultivate a committed relationship to our own soul and to commit ourselves to living in the fullness, the wholeness and the present moment embodied um, life. Like the quality that I'm wanting to express is in the present moment, there's a sense of I'm here, I'm safe and I like who I am and I feel good about who I am and I feel secure about my life even if there's discomfort, right? Even if another person is dissatisfied with what you want or with what you need. The lesson of saying no, the lesson of, of being able to separate oneself from the enmeshment of meeting other people's needs or from the enmeshment of needing other people to meet our own needs. These are one of the deeper dimensions of Venus Pluto. Now, another facet to it is in terms of relationship, there can be a huge issue around commitment. Um, this is a popular topic in terms of the idea of like soulmates, twin flames, and it's not so much my way of thinking. Um, I, I like how Jeff Green describes the idea of soulmates. He describes soulmates in a very simple way. It's simply two souls that are in relationship with one another. In fact, it doesn't even necessarily need to be in the way that I understand it. It doesn't have to be intimate. Simply, they're at a stage along their own journey where they both come into full self-responsible relationship with their own soul, right? So they understand that the relationship itself is always going to be a metaphor for their inner reality. Two people that are relating to one another mutually in that place are at a soulmate relationship because the, the mating is about souls, right? Imagine two people in this intimate relationship and they both are fundamentally committed more than anything else, more than any other impulse to take full responsibility for their own experience because they know that everything that they perceive and everything they're witnessing in the other is a metaphor for what's happening on the inside. Strong craving, strong aversion, that's on the inside. And that's a powerful potential. So commitment to any relationship where it's fundamentally a reflection of the individual's commitment to their own soul, right? That commitment is so powerful because it's gonna say there are gonna be ebbs and flows of feeling. There are gonna be ebbs and flows of what's given, what's not given, how things look, even what forms things are taking. But to stay in a place of respect towards one another because of a commitment to stay in respect towards one's soul, and to take full responsibility for everything is reflecting what's inside. That allows for a deep understanding that this relationship is a portal and a path towards awakening. Okay, so Pluto Venus in the deepest sense says relationship becomes the forum for spiritual awakening. It's not for the weak and the, re and the weary. It isn't. In fact, awakening is never for the weak and the weary um, because it's never comfortable. We don't actually want to be uncomfortable. Most of us, most of the time, aren't really willing to actually 
grasp what it means to begin to wake up. It means we're not a victim. It means the other person isn't causing us how we feel. It means nothing out there is making us feel the way that we're feeling. It means we're fully responsible for our own vibration. You know, there's that Abraham Hicks teaching that talks about the situation in a relationship where one partner is being ownery and broody. And the focus in that teaching is focus on your vibration. Right? Focus entirely on your own vibration. Taken to an extreme, that can become accidentally a point of, I don't need to be around you. I need, you know, but that's not, it's not about that. It's not about rejecting other people because they're at a different vibration, because they're having a bad day. It's about you're responsible for your vibration, your alignment, and you're responsible for determining what you can give and what you cannot give. Enmeshments and patterns can be, oh, the other person's feeling in a bad mood. I have to take responsibility to make them feel better now. Or I'm in a bad mood. I'm expecting you to make me feel better, to cater to my feelings. None of that's true. None of that's actually empowered. So tending to our own vibration means I'm responsible for that app and the world is happening. What is it triggering in me? That's where the gem is. That's where the interest is. So Venus Pluto ultimately learns these deeper lessons around commitment. And it's important that every relationship is seen through entirely, right? If there's a particular dynamic where it's terminated because it's intense and I don't like the way that I'm feeling or these entanglements and it leads to like, you know, very often Venus Pluto will go through relational experiences where there is that fluctuation of being on one side or the other and all of the deeply unmet needs or projections or struggles becomes this point of just breaking it, right? Or it could be as simple as like one person, um, you know, is interested in talking to other people and that just brings up too much jealousy or insecurity. It's like, I can't have that, right? And what that does is it leaves unresolved karma. The nature of this unresolved karma is um, within each individual, whatever is unresolved, it's the jealousy, it's the unwillingness to take responsibility for one's own feelings, right? That's going to recreate that same situation later on. And usually those two people will have to come together later on down the road in some form unless it's resolved somehow one way or another. The teaching, as I've learned it, is in general, two people that have these unresolved dynamics tend to come back, not necessarily in the same configuration, which is interesting, but they will come back with the intention to resolve what wasn't completed, right? In whatever way it's still needed, in whatever form. Um, and that can be like, you know, lovers in one lifetime and, you know, mother, father, right? Or, you know, child, parent in another. It's really interesting, actually. And the circumstances that we come back into will be the perfect template from which the two souls will almost be enforced to work it out. This is an important Pluto thing I want to speak about. It's actually a really helpful thing to understand when it comes to working with synastry and relationships not just between romantic partners, but also between family. And I will eventually teach a synastry composite course. Um, Pluto, when it comes to synastry and, and relationships in general, often will speak to enforced soul dynamics, meaning you can't get out of it. Pluto is DNA, right? Pluto is the program of your incarnation. So we're gonna find ourselves in configurations where due to evolutionary necessity, you know, you're in a particular situation and it's, you have to deal with it, right? You're born in a certain body with a certain DNA. You got to deal with that. That's relevant to your evolutionary growth. Or, you know, you have a child with a, to whom you have a particular, many, we love parent-child relationships. They're beautiful. They're tender. They're important, right? But on a soul level, a lot of these relationships have deeply unresolved karmic stuff, okay? And they're going to be bound together by this deep, human emotional bond that is deeply caring, a familial bond that needs to be tended to. Um, and that's going to keep two souls in this relationship. It is possible to terminate that. We have parents that walk out on children. We have divorce relationships within family units between parents and children often happens, right? That can perpetuate unresolved karmic dynamics. But for the most part, we can have these kinds of bonds that are just really hard. 
right? This person, you know, may have been your husband in your last lifetime and like walked out on you and cheated on you and you just like died with jealousy and anger and, and you know, wanting to take revenge and boom, you're born into the same, you know, biological family or they're your sibling in the next lifetime. You're, that's another great example, right? Your siblings now and you live under the same roof. So we have to really appreciate the nuance of these relationships that we come into. And when we see strong Pluto-Venus dynamics, in particular, Pluto-Venus, when it comes to synastry or composite, very often we have the return of an unresolved soul dynamic where the relationship was sort of terminated early and there's a contract to complete whatever was finished. But completing whatever was finished is fundamentally not some kind of like, you know, I was baking a cake and I forgot to put the eggs in. I got to finish it and put the eggs in. It's not like this physical, abstract, linear, do this thing that you didn't. It's an internal thing, right? The soul content that was denied, the soul healing that was fundamentally denied is what needs to be readdressed. So the gift of the relationship becomes that perfect trigger and reflection for the internal evolutionary choice that wasn't yet made, but gets to be made. So it's always a shared healing. And that's the beautiful thing about Venus Pluto, the relationships we come into when we begin, and I'm saying when because oftentimes there's this like growth edge, even with trying. So it's it's really important to understand that there's often an initial point of resistance. We may not be confronted, but there's often a point with Venus Pluto people where there's a sort of understanding of, okay, this is about commitment to growth. Mm. And so the gift becomes when there's no longer that resistance and the individual accepts the importance of every single relationship in their life. Every single relationship. They see this is fundamentally a blessing because it's pointing me and thus us to our own evolution. And if I want to stick in my negative feelings and associate that with this person and with this relationship, I'm not going to evolve. And of course, one person can, you know, do that work and another person may not be doing that work. In, but sincerely, in more cases than not, if one person is doing the work, it, it invites a field and a, a relational field that invites the other person more easily into it because we resonate with each other. It's more often than not, right? But sometimes the Venus-Pluto work is being able to say, hey, I just realized I'm done with this. This isn't working. I'm going to stop this pattern. The other person may not be happy with that, or you may not be happy with something like that happening to you, right? So it, it might take a while for one individual to come to terms with evolutionary change, and that sometimes is hard for Venus-Pluto experiences. So one more note on commitment. That's why commitment is important, and it's not just about like commitment to an exclusive sexual romantic relationship, just the relationships in our life that are here and, and alive they're important. And to be able to just honor the significance of what every relationship brings up is, is one, to not commodify other people. Oh, that's just a client. That's just a student. Or that's just, you know, um, a past lover. That's just my ex. Or yeah, it, it's not treat other people that way. To treat everyone as equally worthy and deserving of power and wellness and feeling good about their life because you're recognizing that what they're bringing up in you is exactly where you've been lacking in your commitment to that within your own soul. So we actually learn how to respect other people when we learn how to respect ourselves. There can be a resistance to commitment because of the fear of entrapment. Either I don't want to be possessed or I'm afraid of really being seen and being vulnerable because I don't want the other person to hurt me or betray me or leave me. I'm afraid that my needs aren't going to actually be met. So if I can sort of stay free to have my own experience and not get too vulnerable and be too seen by another person, then I'm not going to be hurt. And it's interesting because within the Venus Pluto energetic, there's actually a very deep need to be met on a soul level. And for most souls, this is going to be, in general, a deep orientation towards some form of, it's, it's not about monogamy or polyamory. And this actually, it's a, that way of thinking is something that I don't think is inherently accurate or true 
to the depth of the soul, and I'll explain that in a minute. But it's, it's more so the idea of deep commitment to one other person, right? Deep, deep, solid commitment to one other person that says, no matter what, I'm committed to you. And that means I'm going to find out all of my insecurities, all of my fears, all of my triggers, all of my own personal craving and aversions, and even my desires and my craving for someone else, right? But no matter what, I'm going to stay in that commitment and see this relationship through to its natural flow, right? All relationship forms change. They may change after this lifetime or they might change within a lifetime. That timing is about the program of those two souls. I can't emphasize that enough. Never associate a relationship in a form of relationship with some kind of meaning on its own. Because Venus Pluto says every relationship has its evolutionary purpose and will manifest within the form that it's meant to for the duration of that purpose until that purpose has come to completion. We don't have to control that or worry about that. We have to commit ourselves to it. And whatever it goes and however it moves is what's going to happen. And it'll be known from a place of clarity and cleanness and respect. That's the important part. But that commitment fundamentally becomes, no matter what, I'm going to stay in this commitment. But that means all that vulnerability, all of that stuff, all that being seen, the fear of being left, um, the fear of needs not being met. And, and, and there's so much nuance in that. Um, one thing Jeff Green writes about in the Pluto Venus section in his book, you know, we can have an issue where within an existing relationship, one soul becomes attracted to another person, right? So you either you leave the existing relationship for this new person, or you form a secretive Pluto relationship. Like, what's the taboo, right? This person, I'm not supposed to be with them, but they're like bringing up something in me that I want to experience that I'm not getting with this person. And, you know, we can be secretive and almost cheat inside our own mind. Like it's not even about doing something with another person. If we are holding and harboring an inner reality that is not being shared, we're actually separating ourselves from true vulnerability, right? And, and actually, that's the thing with Venus Pluto. It's e and it's very interesting because Venus is about harmony and balance, right? So the deep inner reality with Venus Pluto can be very much unseen on the outside. We can be had we have these deep desires and feelings and wants, and our partner might not even know. Or we can be really interested in someone and our partner might not even know, right? Or the world might not even know. And that need to experience relational taboos and to experience things that are reflecting these qualities that we're wanting to awaken to. And so if we're not bringing that into conscious awareness and conscious sharing, this can become a secretive reality of separation. And in its most extreme, we can actually find ourselves it's moving in a direction that is in violation of a sort of trust. The key is to understand that we can't just ignore it. If we're ignoring a desire or an attraction, I'm, I'm committed, look, I got the ring, I'm married, I'm whatever, I can't be with another person or I can't feel this way, well, that's not gonna do anything. That's not gonna resolve that inside of your soul. With Pluto, this is a really important thing to understand. With Pluto, any unresolved desire for anything is going to come back at some point down the road to be integrated. Pluto never says what you need to do to resolve the desire. It says desire is the fuel for this evolutionary journey. And I, I wish for everyone to truly grasp the immensity of that and to actually understand what it's like to notice any anger, resentment, jealousy, fear, all of these underlying energetics, until they're met, they're inside of us, dominating our psychology and our experience. And they're going to come back and be reflected and emerge once again at some point down the road. And if there's an attraction that we're suppressing or pushing away because it's too taboo or we're not allowed or we'll, we'll, be a dis we'll disappoint the other person, right? That need that we're not getting met, that we're projecting onto that other person that we're not allowed to be with, it's not gonna be resolved. And it's gonna become a shadow it's going to have to come back at some point. So the question becomes, living from our soul, what do you do? And there's no answer for that. And that's why 
the key with Venus Pluto is not living in this harbored secret reality or just trying to act unconsciously from a manipulative or dishonest place. And that's why there's so much power to a committed relationship from the point of view of Venus Pluto. But one where all of one's soul gets to be brought forward. That's the point. Bringing forth everything inside. What a particular couple might choose to do, that's between them, right? right? Whether it's about the choice to pursue another relationship or whether it's about the choice to not pursue it, but to bring forth, right? The, the point is, um, for each individual, the, the unresolved desires or the jealousy and the fear of being left, whatever, all of that needs to be brought forward. One way or another, what's actually done is secondary to the clarity of bringing it all forward within relationship. But we have to be willing to bring it all forward within ourself. And how many of us are really willing to be that seen? How many of us are truly um, secure enough to let another person see us or to feel brave enough and solid enough in ourselves to actually see another person? Even if what they say or what they want feels scary to us. And herein lies the ultimate strength of Venus Pluto. Ultimately, these souls in their evolutionary growth have that capacity to be radically, deeply present and intimate and vulnerable and available to share their feelings speak their needs and not be a people pleaser, not get sucked into patterns of entanglement and dependency, and to be able to deeply hear the needs of another. And the point is committing to the field of soul evolution, right? Not jumping into what do we do about it? What do I do about it? Because that's that Venusian survival mode, but moving more into a deeply feeling into the truth of the soul path. When we do that, we're going to be accessing our underlying fears. We're going to become very interested in why do I want this? Why do I feel this? What do I want? What is this person symbolizing, right? If we just act upon a feeling or an attraction, we may not be adequately getting to know ourselves, right? And again, it doesn't mean we should or should not act on that attraction, but what is it that it's pointing back to? Because ultimately, we're, we're getting to know our own soul. That's what it's about. Everything we're looking for on the outside is going to speak to something on the inside that we're wanting to awaken to. The qualities of grace, beauty, power that we see out there is in here. And what's always going to be true is our relationships are going to point us back to where there is a calling to have more self-love, to love ourselves more, to have more self-worthiness, self-esteem, to feel more worthy, to live from a deep, lethal place, which is what do I want as a soul? How do I want to live? What are my values? How do I want to feel? What is it that makes me feel uh, solid and strong and, and the beauty of my own inner being? How can I bring that out more? And that's the point. All of our attractions are pointing us back to those qualities. How can I experience that inside of me? That's the key here. So let me look at my notes. There are a couple more points that I want to speak to. You know, on the other end of this, the, the fear of commitment can also be this perpetual having really deep and intense sexual experience or relational experiences, but not sticking around, right? And the soul might have a sort of karmic dynamic where there might be a pattern of getting into relationships with people that want something more from the Venus Pluto then the Venus Pluto is feeling ready or willing to give. So that comes back to agreement and consent and clarity and intention. Like don't not moving from unconscious expectations of just like, I'm feeling really drawn to you and like, oh, you're feeling really drawn to me and do all that stuff. And then it's like, okay, I'm gonna go, but you're gonna go? And the Venus Pluto can be on the other end of that. They can be, oh, I, I have this like, connection and you're gonna go? Don't go. Right? And and then that feeling of being betrayed and being hurt. So the issue of having these uncommitted experiences where that soul's on either side of that equation, it, it, it's really important to understand what's the basis for having those relationship experiences in the first place. So why do I keep on doing that? Or why do I keep on attracting that? What is it I'm trying to get? What is it I'm trying to work out? These are really important lessons. So Venus Pluto really has the ability to be soul counselors. 
I'm a Venus Pluto person myself. I got a really strong Venus Pluto conjunction and I'm an excellent soul counselor. Like my, my skill, my gift, like where I shine in my work is that listening. Um, it's because what I'm growing into as I'm learning and growing on my own evolutionary path is both really understanding the importance of listening to myself not, not just, and I have, I have my Venus in Libra, right? So it's listening, right? Listen, hearing my own needs, right? But the, how important it is to really hear another person. And so the gift of a Venus Pluto person is they might have that deep ability to hear another person and to be able to actually track what's really going on underneath it, right? Like what's, what is it? What's the core soul need? What's the core evolutionary signature underneath these relational experiences? That ability to listen very deeply is what makes Venus Pluto souls oftentimes very good counselors, good soul workers, um, often very skilled at relationship. But that is something that often happens after the whole Plutonian journey of kind of walking through the fire, right? Just as much as Venus Pluto people might find themselves in relationship where they're being needed by other people because they're deep listeners, right? Because other people feel, oh, I can go very deeply with you and you listen very deeply. But the Venus Pluto person might have to understand why am I attracting relationships where I'm always the counselor, right? There might be a need to disentangle a sort of pattern of being needed by others in a certain way. Um, just as much as a Pluto Venus person can find themselves on the other end of that equation as well. So the, the ability to listen very deeply and to like really understand what's going on. It, this is also an underlying commitment within any relationship to say, I'm committed to the clarity and the agency of my own soul. So I'm not going to perpetuate and live within an energy of enmeshment, entanglement, and disclarity. I value most of all the energy of clarity and congruency. And that commitment is a quality that a Venus Pluto person really develops within relationship, right? Not wanting any kind of ambiguity or dishonesty or unclarity to thrive within, like, let's look at it, deal with it completely. And they can offer that and that can be threatening, right? Venus Pluto can be sort of threatening because it, it, it might bring up where other people are not wanting to do that work or where it's like, to actually be listened to that deeply can be a very vulnerable experience. It actually is threatening to where an individual isn't quite ready to be completely honest with themselves. So let's take a look here at some other points. Yeah. You know, the other reason why there could be a fear of commitment is more of an existential understanding of, I know I'm so attached to getting my needs met from the outside. I desire and I crave so much that another person will be there for me, that I can depend on another person. And I'm so aware of how impermanent that I'm so jaded or distrustful or afraid of losing that I don't want to commit, right? It's like the lack of commitment is actually the result of there being a deep vulnerability and fear of being hurt because of a deep knowing on a soul level, it's almost a like guilt. I know that I have to take responsibility for my own needs. And so I'm actually afraid to get into relationship because I know I'm going to be dishonest. I know I'm going to get close and outsource my needs into another person. And then I'm going to get hurt or I'm going to fall into manipulative patterns, all that kind of stuff. Right? So it can just not wanting to open that door, that can of worms of unresolved needs. <laughs> Coming back to this idea of no relationship meets all of our needs. That maturity of understanding is so key because even if we think of this beyond the bounds of an intimate relationship, how often do we feel that um, a teacher is, is acting or relating into a way that disappoints us? Or there's a, a boundary with a student or a client, right? Or an authority, whatever it might be, any relationship, right? I needed you to play this role for me to feel secure. Especially if it's like a teacher student, right? Someone else is a teacher, let's say, right? I needed you to play this role to feel secure. I depended on you. It, the Venus Pluto lesson of no one's going to meet all of our needs brings us back to two important lessons. One, we can't make other people responsible 
to always act in the right way that will make us feel safe and secure. They have shadow. They have their content. And two, if we can understand that, we can always recognize what is it bringing up in me? This is actually calling me into more of my own power. If I want to be resentful or jaded about where they're not acting the way I want them to act, I'm never going to take it as an opportunity to choose my own strength. In a sense, we're always choosing between our weakness and our strength. Choosing our strength is actually always going to resonate with, I'm not going to allow that to victimize me. And that really kind of elevates us to a higher vibration where we realize no one's better than or less than us. And everyone deserves our respect, always, always. Everyone deserves our listening, our care, our interests, always, even if the form and the ways that we're relating might be changing. And we can only give another person respect if we're willing to choose our own strength and see where the evolutionary invitation is for us. Otherwise, we'll give them our weakness because we're going to feel hurt or victimized and we won't want to truly listen or be interested in them. You know, and Venus is always going to, Venus Pluto is always going to bring up our own psychological weakness and limitations. It's just kind of how it goes. Um, okay. So let me look at some of the comments here, see if there's any questions. While I'm doing that reminder, I do give sessions. So for those that are drawn to work with me that would like to receive the soul guidance, I offer intuitive guidance sessions, working with astrology as a way to understand your core soul dynamics. I am a deep listener and I go very deeply into uh, kind of extracting what's, what's wanting to be seen here, like getting to the core of what's your soul journey all about. I'm deeply honored. And the Venus Pluto, by doing this kind of work, I transmute my own soul work. It's a transmutational process. Every session I do gets to be deeper soul work for myself. I also do relationship readings uh, for couples or any two people that want to work together. I also have soul to soul companionship sessions, which is a way of working with me long term to kind of go deeper together. And these are also discounted. Um, check it out, arimosha.com. I'll put it in the description. I also got my training program. Enrollment is still open. We have our first actual class this week and keeping it open for the first few weeks as we're sort of getting into the curriculum it's very easy to catch up so if you're drawn to this work and you want to study with me from the very beginning now is definitely the time to join self-study options are also available okay mm -hmm. okay so i don't see any questions in here if i miss it please let me know Let's look into some examples. These are some interesting examples. Okay, so Jim Morrison. I had a lot of fun uh, learning about this soul. He has Venus and Scorpio in the ninth house, squaring the nodes. So his Venus is a good case study in and of itself and it squares Pluto and Leo in the sixth house. So he was incredibly promiscuous. Um, and had sex with like a lot of people. Like this is fundamentally about a commitment to the freedom of his own soul. Like that Venus needs to be free to live his own values, be himself, be true to himself, speak honestly, and not be limited or defined by anything that wants anything in off. Like this is about a commitment to authenticity, right? But not wanting to, like the typical Venus in the ninth, not wanting to be tied down, tied down right? On a deeper level though, um, it's also a, there's a deep desire within that Venus fundamentally to be known for who he is on a deep level. He actually wanted to be a poet. Like he felt he was more of a poet than a musician. And, and I think the truth of his soul, the truth of his message, the truth of his inner being is really what he wanted to bring out more. And what I found very interesting about Jim Morrison, who, I mean, he, very sexual, very promiscuous, sex with groupies, with fans, you know, he also had a sort of on and off longstanding open relationship with a woman named Pamela Corson, who also had Venus in Scorpio, also Venus squaring Pluto. Now, what I read about this relationship is they were both with many other people, 
while they were also with each other on and off. So there's a sort of shared understanding. They're just both doing their thing, right? You can see also she has a very strong ninth house need for freedom kind of dynamic. Um, lots of different sexual relational pieces that we can analyze at a different time. But that Venus here, there's actually a very strong, like this, this signature Venus in the eighth house with Jupiter can be, it's like a, it's like a deep need, um, an insatiable need for, for more depth, in, intimate depth connection. And she was also in that square to Pluto. It's like something in her soul was really wanting to be seen, really wanting to be met, but couldn't get enough of it. Couldn't quite go there. And she, she had a lot of addictions, right? So there's a, more of a very strong addict, addict quality to this soul. Um, but they really resonated with each other in terms of that passion, that desire to go deep, but also sort of that, that need to stay uncommitted because I think there's a core dynamic of issues with trust and they had a lot of their own struggles as well. So they're both in particular, since Jim is a lot more well-known, great examples for just understanding the energetics of, you know, Venus, Pluto. Beyonce, I love this example. There's a quote um, on Oprah where she said, make sure you have your own life before you're someone else's wife. What a great Venus Pluto statement. Commit to yourself before you commit to someone else. Because she knows what it's like to get committed to someone else, to give them, to give her trust, right? To, to open up, to become vulnerable, to merge with another person and to realize that she's given her power away. Her relationship with Jay-Z, which I was researching this morning, is really interesting. They've been through a lot of rocky times and he was in, he cheated on her um, and that was a really big struggle. From what I've seen from you know their um, interviews and what, what I've read, their relationship, as far as I understand, has been about staying committed and working it out. That's a really big facet of that. But that Venus Pluto fundamentally is Venus Pluto in Libra on the hovering the ascendant, like on one level in terms of we're looking at her relationship to herself. This is a soul that's deeply needing to claim the power and the autonomy and the agency of her own inner harmony. This is another point I really need to emphasize with the Venus Pluto. Venus is beauty, grace, harmony, song. Venus Pluto people are learning to awaken to that within. Yes, it's great to feel the love and the beauty and the mm of relationship and the sexuality and the sensuality, but that's inside of you. That's inside of you. Then if we get overly hooked on that with another, Venus Pluto, interestingly enough, can be totally disconnected from their own grace and beauty and harmony and overly fixated on how another person makes them feel, being sexually satisfied by another person, all of that kind of stuff, or can be very deeply interested in cultivating their own internal space, like growing a relationship to their inner beloved. I once had a dream where I was told, whenever you care for the beloved on the inside, she will always show up by your side. And I got that dream when I was spending a little bit of time um, at a Taoist temple practicing Qigong, which is very much about internal cultivation. So I found that dream to be a very interesting, you know, a, a beautiful message. It's like one of those messages that stick with me. Caring for the inner beloved is the starting point. And it's also the ending point, right? Start there, the world shows up as a metaphor for what's in there. And how we treat other people is a metaphor for how we're treating ourselves too. So, you know, Oftentimes, like the power of loss or betrayal or needs not getting met actually pushes the soul deeper within to their own beloved. Like, so we can find ourselves extracting deeper creativity and harmony and grace and beauty, right? Venus Pluto can be poetry, can be song, can be music, uh, can be art, anything that's graceful, right? Um, Edgar Allan Poe, who we've looked at before, he also has a Venus Pluto. We looked at his moon, but Venus, Pluto, Venus from the point of view of the poetry, also dealing with the loss. I think he's right here. Oh, I didn't include him. Dealing with the loss of his wife, he had Venus, Pluto, and Pisces. A lot of what he channeled, just from the Venus perspective, the poetry as well, right? It's a way of connecting with that inner beloved. Anything that's poetic or graceful or beautiful is you're in the dance. Like when you write poetry, when you dance, when you sing, you're in relationship to something. I don't know what that something is. It's your soul. It's life. 
It's the moment. And, and, and it, it's like dancing with your, with your lover. Um, but really, dancing with your lover is because you're feeling something on the inside, right? Right? It, it, there's the, you're both feeling it. But you can feel that in your art, in your, in, in your expressions of beauty in life. So oftentimes channelizing that through um, forms of creativity and expressions of beauty um, are what we find happening a lot with Venus Pluto. And she's just a great example of a soul that's kind of gone very deeply. Of course, Venus rules all that Libra stellium. So of course, we're dealing with trust issues and, you know, disillusionment and whatnot. Um, and, and of course, like being, being a channel of this amazing beauty and harmony and grace and music, Libra in the 12th. I mean, wow. Um, both of them. He's a, he's, he actually has Venus and Scorpio conjunct Neptune. Like, they're both just amazing musicians. Okay, let's look at the next chart. We've done Elvis, but once again, he obviously, he's a very Plutonian soul. We probably will return to him several times over because it's a great example. This guy loved sex, really. Like, and, and, and physical, like, so pleasure, sex, um, you know, physical stimulation. Of course, that lesson with Venus and Capricorn is learning how to have restrictions and limitations, boundaries. But that Pluto and Cancer in the eighth is actually outsourcing um, his physical, biological sensations to a deeply unresolved emotional need to merge with the external feminine. I feel this urging and I want, I want to get, and it's almost like I can't get enough of that. That's a very much insatiable need for life, for pleasure, for sexual connection. Um, and I think the lessons of that Venus and Capricorn is learning how to com contain it, learning how to embody that within himself. And of course, to, to a great extent he did, he was such an a sensual person, his art, his creativity. But don't we see that with this very creative people? They often get to a point where, um, they have all the wealth and sex and pleasure, Venus, right? And they become overly consumed by that. They become almost addicted to that. And it's no longer about the internal cultivation. And then usually like later in their life, like their creativity is not as active. When we're really, it's almost like this torture, like we're, we're with the, the craving and the aversion, but we're not gonna let that take us out of the moment. Like that's where the art, you know, my favorite, uh, what's that guy? What's his name? I'm forgetting his name. The artist guy that I, the, the Rick Rubin, he talks about art really coming from that like tortured place or being really, it's not just a Pluto sun thing, it's also a Pluto Venus thing, right? Because beauty, expressions of beauty and, and um, harmony um, come from our voice, come from our hand, Venus being the throat, it's like the, the, the what we're singing, right? And it's the heart chakra. It's what we're able to create when we're feeling ourselves when we're in relationship to our own soul, okay? So just a really good example of that. Um, Kurt Cobain, another honorable mention here. Um, he had Venus in Pisces in the seventh opposite Pluto. Um, and I just wanted to point out both he and Courtney Love um, have a Venus Pluto. She has a Pluto Venus square. And so he's just another person to think about. I'm not gonna go very deeply into that. Um, Charles Dickens and George Carlin are two other honorable mentions. I didn't have the time to research them either. Okay, so this completes our class. Let me just take a look to see if there are any more questions. Do you think having a stroke has to do with Pluto in the first or is more, that's not related to this topic? Um, um, I, already, I will be very thankful if you will share your insight. I have Venus opposed Pluto and Pluto in my fifth. I'm not gonna speak to your particular chart dynamic um, but let me just say about this in general, okay? Let's talk about Venus-Pluto opposition. I'm speaking broadly in this talk to Venus aspects to Pluto in general, but just think about the nature of the opposition. We're going to be drawn into relationship, which is the whole realm of, oh, I like the way I feel, I'm attracted to this, or I like this, I wanna eat this, I wanna have that, right? And that's gonna trigger our deepest insecurities, fears, addictions, and unresolved psychological content. And it's gonna feel like a duality. So other people might bring up all of these issues of now I'm entrapped, now I'm fear, now I'm stuck, or now I'm feeling deeply repelled or deeply repulsed, now I'm deeply afraid. And the key is to be able to integrate that polarity. That's the teaching of oppositions in general. 
to get beyond the polarity or dualities of them and integrate them together. To be able to embrace the confrontation and the discomfort that arises and be able to actually become more embodied and more masterful. Oppositions teach more mastery, but it's by way of facing all the triggers and psychological discomfort that that Venus will then bring up for that individual soul. Um, that will produce an immense amount of soul awareness and psychological self-knowledge. Um, yeah, G George Carlin. I mean, I'll just say that like, he has Venus and Aries in the ninth house. Again, truth speaker. And he's so vulgar. He has Venus and Aries in the ninth squaring Cancer Pluto in the 12th. And I was just listening a little bit to this talk he gave around women and men. And he's just, you know, Venus and Pluto, Venus squaring Pluto with Venus in Aries in the ninth. Truthful and honest and to the point. Like that's the kind of soul where it's like, I'm not going to bullshit you. I'm going to be to the point. And I'll end this talk with this point. You know, Venus, Pluto people, when they're in their soul, they're going to speak to you. And when they're speaking to you or when they're listening, you're going to feel their deep presence. They're going to speak that makes you feel like they're really sharing themselves. They're going to speak that makes you feel like they're really listening. Um, their touch will feel like it's an authentic touch. Um, when, when they touch, touch is also about listening. When you're touching, you're listening. How does the body react? What are you communicating in your touch? Touch can be a Mercury thing. Touch can be a Venus thing in the same way. right? You're communicating ideas, but you're also listening and receiving and engaged in this relational experience with touch. And you're giving something and giving from your soul because you want to give and you're authentic versus giving but you don't really want to give or withholding giving because you're you know not feeling available like all these different dimensions around touch and giving when you're in your soul the, the the giving and the sharing and the relating and the listening and the receiving are all very deep and are all very felt okay thank you all for joining me we will come back next week with what comes after venus pluto mars all right bye for now